Okay, last week we, we covered the premillennial view of the Battle of Armageddon and leading up to the Battle of Armageddon and the follow through of the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, tonight I want to I want to share with you the what I believe be a more well certainly more the the biblical view of the Battle of Armageddon and what what it refers to and how it has already we're not waiting for it to come in the future but it's already taken place. Um, first of all, you need to turn to Revelation chapter. 16 and verse 16 because of, because this is the said this is the statement that says then they gathered the kings together in to the place that in the hebrew is called armageddon now if it weren't for that verse we wouldn't know what armageddon was okay and i'm saying that not to make fun of it but to say a whole cottage industry has been built on, a, on the Battle of Armageddon, and it's so uh, very little said about it. It's nothing, there, there's not this immense amount of material to, to research and find out and deal with that you would think for something that has complicated the minds and the religious world so so well into the battle and the, the uh, altogether importance of the Battle of Armageddon, and yet it's so very touched on even in revelation or whatever whatever interpretation you want to give revelation uh it's a, a minor event and i'll show you how minor it is in just a moment all right <clears throat> now then john talks about the uh kings joining for, uh, forces with the dragon and the two beasts in a place called armageddon number one important there is no record historically or biblically about a battle of armageddon okay uh, get back to it i promise i will in about a week or two i won't get to it right now but trust me this is what he has reference to all right now in chapter 19 of revelation beginning beginning in verse 19 then i saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the white on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. That's the battle of Armageddon. That's all there is. Now, what can we make out of all that? Well, <coughs> number one, the bad guys lose. Okay? Uh, it is not a long stain. It doesn't take a long time. It's very fast. It's very quick. Uh, two of the two two facets are thrown into the fiery lake, uh, and the rest are killed or destroyed by the sword coming from the rider. Who's the rider? Jesus is the rider. 
I mean, take my word for it. If you had, if you were in here when we did Revelation, we covered this in detail. I don't want to have to try to get that all covered again because it's quite complicated to start in the middle. But take my word for it, please, on this on this account that um, the slain and the sword belong to the rider on the white horse. His army, notice his army, the, the rider of the white horse army does what? Nothing. Nothing. There is no battle. There is no army. There's no clash. There's no sword. There's no tanks. There's no helicopters. There's nothing. Okay? We, I'm sorry, but Mr. Lindsay and company have built a world uh, around something that it's not there. Um, Christ defeated Satan for all of us. And he, all he asks us to do is what? Follow him. I don't have to fight anybody. I don't have to fight Satan. I am to be aware of Satan. But Satan does not hold any power over me as a Christian because Christ has become and is victorious. And when did he do this? At the cross. At the cross. Okay. So at the cross, Christ is victorious. The battle's over. The war's ended. Now, is Satan completely uh, in, in, in chains in prison? Well, we're going to find out about that. Because it just so happens that we leave the Battle of Armageddon and we get to the part that everybody who's ever studied this cares anything about. And that's chapter 20 of Revelation. This is where the whole system, or a large part of the premillennial system, is set up around. Now, there, we've proven, and I wanted to prove, and I did, and hopefully I've proven to you, that there's a lot more premillennialism than Revelation chapter 20. But Revelation chapter 20 is where a lot of their theology comes from. So let's look at Revelation. Chapter 20. And the first, it's only four verses. Even this is, even this is relatively brief compared to all the material that has been written about it. And I don't know of any four verses in the Bible who have had more material written about it than the binding of Satan and the way the premillennial uh, and those believing in premillennialism have tried to make it into a bigger and bigger and bigger amount of material, possibly to primarily sell books, but I wouldn't want to accuse them of anything like that. All right. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of, to the abyss and holding in his right hand a, gold, a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That's premillennial doctrine basis right there. And from that, they extrapolate all kinds of interesting ideas. All right, let's look at some things here. In Revelation 9, the fallen star, which is Satan in Revelation 9, the fallen star possesses the keys to the abyss. Okay? But now... The victory is taken away from it. The power shifted. Satan no longer has the key to the abyss as he once did because Christ has taken it away from him. The power has been neutral. His power has been neutralized. All right. What does it mean when it says he's been bound? All right. The Greek word means to, to bind time uh, imprison or prohibit. That's the Greek meaning of the word. Now, the angel rendered Satan powerless, which would be Christ, but he's powerless. Why is he powerless? When did he, when did he lose his power? 
Death of Christ. Okay, of Christ. Okay. Christ takes it away from him. Now, what was his power? What is Satan's ultimate power? Fear of death. Well, death is death. That, that's it. I mean, you take death out of the picture and Satan has no power. When did he get that power? When did he get that power? Think about the world. How about Garden of Eden? Yeah. When God said, if you eat the tree, you're going to what? Die. Why is he going to die? Why did he die? Why did Adam die? Why has everyone else since Adam and Eve died? Because of sin. And who who creates the sin? Who who uh, around, who creates the opportunity for sin? Satan. How does he do it? He tempts man just like he tempted Eve and ultimately Adam by saying, what did God say you could do? And did he say you could eat of any tree in the garden? And she said, we can eat, or did he say you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? She said, no, we can eat of all the trees in the garden except the one in the center of the garden, which he said, stay away from. And if we eat of that tree, we will die. And he said, what did Satan say? You shall not surely die. Okay. Where so what what is what is Satan's power? Mm -hmm. Is it power to deceive, tempt, and lie? And when when man for when man submits to those three things, man ultimately dies. Okay. So what is the ultimate power of, of Satan? To die. Because death separates you from God. Okay? In other words, that's the idea of death at that point because you're separated from God. Now, when we die now, as members of the body of Christ, we're not separated. We're brought home. But that was the, that was the initial idea. So power of death. When did... When did Satan lose the power of death. Right. Now, this is tricky because you're going to answer the wrong way, probably. When did Satan lose the power of death over mankind? You've only got a couple of choices. Come on, this is not <laughs> rocket science. At the cross. Good. Not at the resurrection. Not at the resurrection. He lost the power at the cross. The proof of the loss of power was the resurrection. Christ overcame Satan when he lived a perfect life and became the perfect sacrifice. So then why didn't God just pull him off, take him from the cross and take him back home? Because we wouldn't know what happened. God allowed him to be buried for three days. Why three days? Why not two days? Why not a day and a half? Why not 35 minutes? Why three days? To show us that he was dead. Okay. Because in the Jewish mind, no one was completely dead and could not be, you know, have any life about it until three days. That's the reason Christ waited how many days to raise Lazarus? Three days. Why? Because he wanted to establish that Lazarus was dead. So if you raised him in a day and a half, there could have been those who said, well, maybe he was, you know, maybe he wasn't quite dead. I mean, he could have been, you know, swooned or whatever, because that's that was that becomes a theory of what happened to Christ. But the reality is there was three days with the idea of it being that's the length of time it took to establish in the Jewish mind that an individual was dead. All right, so um, the angels um, takes care of Satan and binds him and he is bound for how long? A thousand, years. a thousand years. That's what it said. You can't argue that. I wouldn't argue that with a, you know, you'd be a fool 
to say it was less or more than a thousand years, because that's what the Bible says. But hang on in. But does a thousand years is it figurative or is it literal? That's the question. Now, what does it say? We can all read what it says. Now, in the Jewish mind, numbers held significance. There are numbers used throughout the book of Revelation. There are numbers used throughout the Bible, not just Revelation. But numbers meant more to them than they do to us. All right? We, do, we, we don't have that mindset. We were never we were never taught this. It's never been used this way for the most part in Western culture. So we're not familiar with it. But it is a fact that the numbers of Revelation and the numbers throughout the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, were significant because they meant something to the Jewish mind that they don't necessarily mean to us. All right, <clears throat> the, the number 1,000 in the Jewish mind symbolizes perfection or completeness or a perfect time. So translating that into English, it would be that Satan was bound for a perfect time. He was bound perfectly. He couldn't move. He was totally, completely bound. All right? Now, how do you know that? Well, let's, let's look at a couple of verses. Um, look in the Old Testament. We'll have to go back there to see what, how the Jews related to the numbers. All right, in Job chapter 9, verse 3. It says, though one wished to dispute, though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him time out of a thousand. You know, out of a thousand questions, you couldn't get one of them right. Well, what if he'd ask a thousand and one questions? Could he got the last one right? If it's a literal number, why why that why did he need a thousand? Why didn't he have five thousand? Why didn't he have ten? All right, now, Psalm 50 and verse 10. For every animal of the forest is mine, God speaking. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. So if there's a, if there's a thousand and three hills, <laughs> and there's cattle on the, third, the thousand, one, two, and three, they don't belong to God. It's just kind of just just right up to the thousand. <coughs> no, it's not saying that at all. No one no one will agree would agree with that. That what what he, the psalm is saying is all the cattle on the earth belong to God. Why didn't he just say that? Yeah, I don't know, but he said he he used the he used the concept of a thousand hills. But a thousand hills meant every hill beyond number. Because I doubt the psalmist expected anyone to go around the world and count all the hills. And then you'd have to debate which was a hill and which was a mountain and which was, you know. Uh, and we didn't have satellite. We can actually do that now, but when, with satellite photography, we can actually know exactly how many hills there are on the earth. I don't know how many hills there are, but we can know, depending on how, how high a hill has to be to be considered a hill. In Lubbock, Texas, it only takes a slant <laughs> to be considered a hill. But in some places, it takes, when you're around mountains, um, you know, hills have to be pretty high just to qualify. In Lubbock, a bump in the road can sometimes be considered a hill. All right. One more. Psalm 105 and verse 8. <clears throat> he remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. Okay. 
So the word of God applies to a thousand generations. But if there's a thousand and one generation, the one won't count. Okay? Well, I mean, if you're going to take the number literally, that's what it means. And no one, even premillennialists, would argue against the idea that the cattle on a thousand and one hills, the one hill wouldn't be God's cat, or that the generations one past a thousand. They're going to, they, they know that. We know that. We may not know, you didn't know, or maybe you didn't know, that how the Hebrew mind registered a thousand. But you read the verse of cattle on a thousand hills to the, to the degree that you knew that meant that all the cattle on the earth belong to God, along with everything. By the way, that would include horses, that would, you know, I mean, is it only the cattle that belong to God? Or do the ducks and the chickens and the hen, you know, no, how about the goats on mountains? Do they belong to God? Yeah. Well, God didn't list all those animals. He just said the cattle belong to him. You'd have thought of him. Logically, you'd have thought he'd said sheep rather than cattle anyway, because he's more concerned about sheep than he is cattle. But what is he, what is the, what's the point? The point is when you say a, a thousand, when you use the term one thousand in biblical understanding. You're not just saying a thousand. You're saying everything. The perfect, complete. All right. So let me. Second Peter 3 8. Which is? Says a day is like a thousand. Okay, a thousand years and a thousand years a day. Again, place, the, the, the same principle time is unimmeasurable with God. Uh, it, time doesn't count. There is no time with God. And that's when, and of course, we've talked about this before. You start trying to make the days a thousand years, a thousand years a day, and you start trying to use that mathematically and make all that work out to something. It doesn't work because it's not literal. It's figurative. He's saying every thing that whatever the thousand is, every part of it belongs to and is, is belongs to God. Now, <clears throat> the word 12, I'm, excuse me, the number 12, well, the word 12 too, but the number 12 also has the idea of complete and uh, uh, perfection and none, none, none other. If you say 12, uh, quite possibly uh, there's a reason why Jesus chose 12 apostles. In other words, he could have picked 11, he could have picked 13. Ultimately, there's going to be more than 12, but Jesus chose 12 because this was his complete group at the time. Okay? They're going to trade out, they're going to change out, there's going to be more. But at that time, he was complete. All right. So if, <clears throat> so if 12, represents completeness. What is 12 times 12? 144. How, well, that's amazing. Who would have thought of that number? Anyway, 144. So you have completeness times completeness is absolute unadulterated what? Completeness. You can't get more complete. Want to bet? I can. Because I'm going to add a thousand to it. And I'm going to make it 144,000. And I'm going to tell you that's how many people are in heaven. <laughs> now, literal or figurative? I hope it's figurative. Because I would think by now, surely, there have been 144,000 righteous people since the beginning of time. And if 144,000 literal is all there's going to be, Good chance I'm not going to get there. However, if I make it figurative, which it is, and I say it is absolutely everybody that is righteous, regardless of the number, it's, it's the, the concept of righteousness and completeness. Every complete, every 
righteous person will be in heaven. God guarantees it. He said, I'll, I will put a number out there so astronomically large of completeness that you can't imagine anything else. Now, does that, what does that 144,000 mean to us? Not much without some under, understanding of the Jewish understanding, because to us, we don't think that way. But who was the who who was the original recipients of the seven letters to the, of the letters to the seven churches? Well, there were Gentiles certainly in those congregations, but there were Jews in every one of those congregations. How did they get there? Well, there was a persecution, and they were spread out all over the world. So every time they read things like this. There would be Jewish scholars or Jewish people within the group who would say, Here, you know, here's what it means. Here's what we're talking about. Um, the lamb that was slain on the throne. What does that mean to you? And if you tell me it's Jesus, I'm going to tell you only because you know it from a Jewish understanding. What does it mean to you otherwise? It's a bloody animal slap, slapped out over a throne. Yuck. Why would anybody use that kind of terminology to discuss Jesus? I mean, that's not a very complimentary uh, picture that we give of this is, this is Jesus, a lamb slain on a throne. But, that, but unless you have a Jewish background, which we do somewhat because we we have the Old Testament. You you wouldn't worry about that. You wouldn't see that as a threat. Okay, why would the, why does that matter? Well, you must remember that during the time of the first century, uh, the mail service didn't go by email. Uh, they honestly didn't use, uh, and they would have, except Al Gore hadn't invented the uh, internet yet. So they couldn't use email. So they had to use whatever they had, which was couriers. You gave them the scroll, you gave them the paper, whatever it was, parchment, whatever. And a guy ran from one city to the next city and delivered the mail. Okay. Well, under Roman law, <clears throat> the courier, the person carrying the parchment, could be stopped by any soldier anywhere and have the have the letter confiscated. Well, it would make sense then if you didn't want it confiscated, write, write something that would make no sense to the Roman soldier. Now, do you see any reason why a Roman soldier would worry about a letter that talks about a lamb that's slain laying on a throne? I mean, it sounds barbaric, but it certainly doesn't sound any threat to Rome. What if he referred to him as the king of the world, the king of the earth, which Jesus is? Why didn't he use that term? Well, that could have gotten the Roman soldier's attention and he could have confiscated the letter and never gotten delivered. But if you write it in a, if you want to call it a code, I really don't, to me, code cheapens it. But if you want, if you want to call it a code, who can interpret the code then? Well, you got to have somebody on the other end that can interpret the code. And did they have people on the other end that could? Yes, they did. Because the Jews who were in the congregation, and if not, an apostle who comes by, would easily say, you know, this, 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 and this to the Gentile people. Of course, I contend most every congregation, and I suspect every congregation, had Jewish people in it, otherwise God wouldn't send a letter to them they couldn't understand. So, but God knows where the Jews are, and God knows when the word is in the letters. And when they read that, if there's somebody raising their hand in the back going, hello, oh, what are you talking about? There's a nice scholar there who can say okay and he, you know he can he can talk about the ride the writings or the uh speaking of ezekiel daniel hosea any of the prophets and bring all this together so it makes sense 
Whereas with us, we read it in our, <clears throat> our pragmatic, scientific mindset, which is what we were all raised with, which is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just that's how we're raised. We believe numbers mean numbers. You know, uh, we, don't, we don't think of numbers as symbols of something else. We see them as numbers that you put on a piece of paper and add up, divide, subtract, or multiply. Okay, so that's what the thousand years is, is a statement of completeness. Now, I'm going to give you two different views of what this can be. I'm not saying it's the only two views. It's the two views that I believe are actually, they intersect, but they are slightly different. And it's coming from two of our brethren. And one of them is Dr. Crouch. Here's his view. Most of you knew Dr. Crouch. His view was that Jesus completely subdued Satan and his power by his life, death, and burial, and resurrection. There is no reason to believe that Satan is bound today, but he was bound then. He was completely bound at the, at the crucifixion and the subsequent resurrection. That he had completely defeated Satan couldn't move because it was over for Satan. Show, the show had closed. And, but there is no reason to believe that Satan is bound today. Rather, Satan is very active in today's world. Uh, Christ died on the cross, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven. God bound Satan, however, in God's scheme, Satan has been allowed to continue with his work as the adversary, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. In other words, God proved at the crucifixion and the resurrection that Satan was completely captivated, ruined, stopped. And that is, uh, Genesis says he'll have his head crushed. Okay, his head was crushed at the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. However, in God's wisdom, he said, I'm also going to now, after I have proven he's bound, I'm going to allow him to operate yet for a short time. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For a short time. Uh, and still be, a, still be an adversary in the world as a roaring lion seeking, seeking whom he may devour. All right. That's Dr. Crouch's view. The view I particularly think fits closer, but and may not, is that Satan was bound and cast into a pen. It represents the defeat and capture with reference to God's overthrowing of the Roman Empire. Now, why the Roman Empire? Well, because at the time, there had never been a power on earth that was as great as the Roman Empire. Uh, they were in charge of everything. They controlled the they controlled the then known world that they operated. You didn't breathe unless you broke unless you breathed in, in relation to Rome. Uh, there was nothing that they didn't have control over. They were a group of hideous non-Christian people. They persecuted uh, the church. They were terrible. Okay. God says, okay, I'm going to let them be what they are. I'm not going to make them do anything. I'm going to allow them to be what they are. And I'm going to defeat them. I'm going to defeat them so my people can see that no matter how bad things are, I win. I have to let them be this bad to prove the point. Because you see, if it was just some rinky-dink little army out here, that you could blow away anyway. People would go, oh, well, I ain't gone for that. I'm not going to handle that. That's nothing. But we're talking about a worldwide power 
that was insurmountable at the time. So Rome is completely, the Roman Empire is complete, totally destroyed when God gets ready. Uh, they're, they're, and Rome, the Roman Empire has never regained the status that it had at that time. In fact, the Roman Empire has really never, uh, the, the Roman aspect, the Italian aspect, has never come back anything. I mean, even, even in World War II, it was the third rate, uh, third rate part of the axis. I mean, you know, it was there, but uh, nobody, nobody feared the Roman and uh, the Italian aspect of the Axis as much as they did the German and the Japanese. So even at that point, they weren't as powerful as the other two, but they certainly never had worldwide power. Okay, so then Rome is defeated. Everybody's agreed it's defeated. There's nothing left of it. And God says, okay, I have proven my point, but I'm going to allow it to, I'm going to allow Satan some level of freedom, okay? I'm going to talk about it, some more about that in just a minute, so don't think I'm skipping anything. All right. Uh, verse 3, chapter 20. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over to keep him from deceiving the nature of the anymore until the thousand years was ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. All right. Until the thousand years is ended. Well, when is that going to end? Well, a thousand years. One, two, three. No, 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 no. We're back to it being complete. He's completely bound. He will not be allowed freedom until what? Until he manages to work his way out of it? Until he gets the handcuffs off? Till he gets the ropes off his hands and feet? No. He's going to be allowed to, after that, he must be set free. Who set him free? Who has the, who has the power to set Satan free? The same person that was able to bind him and no one else. So God chooses to let Satan be free. All right? Now, why would he do that? He beats him in, he beats him either, 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 and this is where I think the two ideas intersect. You can take either one and you can say Satan was defeated either, well, we know he was defeated at the cross. I mean, there, that, that's not the issue. But is that what John's talking about? Is the issue not did he defeat him at the cross? Because he did. But is the defeat at the cross, is that what it's talking about? Or is it the defeat? of Rome and the symbol of Satan at that time, at its high point. Doesn't really matter. The key is he was defeated, okay? If you are defeated to that degree, how in the world, who has the power to change that? The same person that defeated you. I defeat you, I can also free you. Now, why would God do that? Well, after he defeats him, um, you'll notice that uh, even, even at the defeat, people still didn't acknowledge him. If you take the Roman view, Roman Empire view, there were still, the Romans still didn't mind do it, even though he'd been defeated. Even though the, the Roman Empire's gone, you didn't see, uh, you didn't see people rushing to, Christianity after the Roman Empire was defeated because they didn't give God the credit for it. They thought the uh, the, the uh, wild Indians could do it, I guess, because basically the barbarians and, and the nomads were what overthrew Rome physically. And uh, somehow they thought that would have worked. Why didn't that work a thousand years ago? Uh, how many years that Rome was in existence? Why didn't they do it before? Well, one time. God was not ready for that. But God is <laughs> finished with Satan. He will let him establish another army at another time and another place, but God will simply defeat him again. In other words, if you want to consider Satan 
still around, which he is. If you want to uh, believe that Satan still has the power to destroy mankind, which he does. If you want to believe that uh, that a non-believer will not, will never see heaven, that's true. But the point is that God still wins. It doesn't matter how many times we go through this process, God wins. Now, whether it be a literal battle, I mean, a literal kingdom, a literal like Rome, or if it's a physical, a spiritual thing, God still wins. And God will let him up and knock him back down again. Let him up, knock him back down again. What we've got to understand is we win. Christians win. We are victorious. The only way that we cannot be victorious is if we choose to change sides. God, uh, Satan cannot touch a Christian. Now he's going to touch you. He can touch him physically, like he did, like he did Job. But he can't touch his spirit. He can't send him to hell. No way. Unless now, before you say, Roger just said, "Once saved, always saved." I didn't say that. For there's a reason why I didn't say that, because the Christian can turn his back on God. If he does, he's lost. But as a Christian, why would you ever even consider doing that? I think I have uh, used this illustration here before, but in case there's someone new that hasn't heard it. When I taught in the junior high high school group years ago, uh, it was around Super Bowl time. And um, I brought a stack of $1,000 checks, all signed by me. They would, and if you dropped them, they all bounced. But then <laughs> the, the kids didn't know that. Was it was a week after the Super Bowl. And um, I told him I would bet, give him a thousand one odds of who would win the Super Bowl. And of course, they just looked at me like I was a fool. All you had to do was watch last Sunday night. And last Sunday, you saw he won the stupid Super Bowl, Roger. Nobody would bet any, even a dollar would be stupid to bet a dollar against a thousand and I get to pick the winner. And the game's over. I said, but that's what we do with Christ. We're willing, you know, we'll we'll give away, we'll give away because we bet on the wrong team. And we know who's gonna win. You're gonna be you'd be a fool to bet on the team that lost. Even at a thousand one odds, because you're never going to get, you're going to lose your dollar. And yet we bet our souls on the losing team. And we allow Satan to get us to change uniforms and move over to his side, thinking somehow he's going to win. And we have every proof known to mankind that he's not going to win. All right, that's the binding and the loosening, and we're going to get to the loosening more next week uh, because we're going to talk about the loose part and how all this fits together, both in premillennialism and absolutely what the Bible says. Next week, for those of you taking notes, get ready for Gog and Magog. Because we're going to 
we will now discuss God and may God and come to a biblical <coughs> conclusion of what John talked about in Revelation and what Ezekiel talked about in chapters 38 and 39. So I hope you make it back. And thank you for your attention.